Thank you, sir. Thanks, and welcome, everyone, to today's Cyber Seminar. We're happy to welcome Peter Wilcock and Jeff Marr, both involved with the NSED project, who will be talking to us today about Streamlab, a cooperative experimental research project. For those of you who know, uh, and for those of you who don't, I should say, um, just to quickly go over this interface, if you're unfamiliar with it, you'll note the chat box in the lower right-hand side. Uh, you can select who to send chat to in that drop-down box that defaults to all participants. And you can direct some questions there if you have any throughout today's talk. If you have any technical problems uh, with the web, this presentation is available for download on the Kawazi website. And we're always eager to get feedback on these, and so that can be directed to me via email at commanager@kawazi.org. There's one more of these left, which is, I believe, two weeks, um, more or less, two weeks from yesterday. May 11th, and that's going to be Paul Brooks from SARA talking about a legacy product out of that NSF-funded STC, a prototype environmental observatory, perhaps for Kawazi, Cleaner, and Neon. And so the complete calendar and links to these presentations are available on the Kawazi Cyber Seminar current homepage. I'd now like to introduce today's speakers. With us is Jeff Marr who has his professional engineer's license and has received his master's degree from the University of Minnesota in civil engineering, having done his thesis research at the St. Anthony Falls Lab, where NSED is headquartered. He currently serves as the project manager for the Stream Restoration Integrative Project and is the director of knowledge transfer for NSED. And Peter Wilcock, who I'll be turning the call over to, is a professor of geography and environmental engineering at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. Peter's received his PhD from MIT in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences, and he's the leader of this group, the Stream Restoration Group at NSED, which for those of you who most of you obviously know is National Center for Earth Surface Dynamics. So thank you both for being with us here today, and Peter, I'll turn the call over to you. Okay, thanks, John. Um, it's a pleasure to join these uh, quasi seminars, and um, the project I'm going to talk about is something that is not necessarily an entirely uh, new idea, and it's only something that's begun, but I think it's an opportunity that uh, will hopefully be of interest to uh, quite a few people. And so we, we call it Streamlab, and, um, and, and the, the purpose of this uh, seminar is to uh, introduce it. Um, what I'll be talking about today, uh, I'll, I'm going to give a, a, a very brief uh, uh, overview of NSET, uh, in part to motivate uh, how and why we're doing Streamlab, and then Streamlab is, and uh, a little bit about the facilities that are part of Streamlab at present and and at least some of its future. Um, then I'll spend some time talking about what we're doing this year, and there's a little bit then about where things go uh, into the future. Uh, so uh, NSET, and I apologize those of you who uh, listened to the talk, the seminar last week, uh, uh, Chris Paola went through a little bit of this, but I think it's worth it to make sure folks know what uh, NSET is about. It's, it's a NSF uh, Science and Technology Center. Uh, its purpose is to catalyze development of an integrated predictive science uh, of the processes shaping the surface of the earth uh, in order to transform management of ecosystems, resources, and land use. Uh, key words here, uh, it's an integrative uh, 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 science approach, uh, integrating uh, the relevant different sciences to the uh, Earth surface, or uh, uh, the predictive uh, uh, Earth surface science, um, and uh, Catalyze is important because this is clearly more than any one center can do, and and so partly we do research and partly we try and and and, and uh, uh, develop other research with other other uh, collaborators. Uh, who NSET is, uh, 19 uh, investigators at nine institutions, uh, which you can see sprayed across the right side of the screen. Um, and, and the fields involved are, are most of those that would be relevant to understanding how the uh, Earth's surface works. Um, we're organized into six initiatives. Uh, three of them are research initiatives, and then three are about uh, uh, education, knowledge transfer, and diversity. Uh, the desktop watersheds uh, initiative is about uh, uh, predicting uh, how watersheds work, uh, taking advantage of the uh, re 
resolution possible in laser swap mapping, we now know you know the re the resolution and the elevations of, of watersheds to uh, a level that can be predictive. Uh, the stream restoration uh, integrated project is what I'm the lead of, and Jeff Marr is the project manager. Uh, and our goal is is to uh, improve uh, stream restoration, both science and practice. Subsurface architecture looks at how um, um, uh, channels uh, leave deposits in the subsurface uh, with an application for subsurface fluids, whether groundwater or hydrocarbon. Um, although we have uh, 19 uh, investigators and nine institutions, uh, NSET is not a, a, a closed shop. There are many opportunities for collaboration, and that, that uh, these community activities are absolutely central to our purpose. Uh, the visitor's program, uh, which I'll say a little bit more about later because uh, Streamlab is sort of an offshoot of it, is, um, is an opportunity for people outside of NSED to come work at our facilities uh, and in, in collaboration with uh, uh, technical support that's possible. Uh, we have sabbatical visitors. We pull together workshops and working groups on, on defined topics within our, our integrated project areas. We have a number of postdoctoral fellowships that we uh, have active at any given point. Uh, the the postdocs are primarily uh, serving to synthesize among different institutions and different disciplines. Uh, a wide range of short courses, both in uh, subsurface architecture and stream uh, uh, restoration, and then we have uh, undergrad internships uh, as well. Uh, okay, uh, what is Streamlab uh, and how did it come about? Um, the basic idea is that collaborative experiments, uh, transdisciplinary among physical, chemical, and biological processes and streams, uh, an essential piece is that these experiments are done at field scale, uh, and we incorporate uh, advanced technology as much as possible. Um, it's not just NSAID researchers, but there are a wide range of outside uh, uh, researchers that are that are collaborating with us. Um, and as a little bit of background, the, the um, visitors program at NSED has, uh, we're now in our fourth year, and the visitors program has taken different forms over time. Um, uh, initially, it was uh, a program that was more geared towards individual investigators making proposals coming in to uh, one or the other facilities, oftentimes St. Anthony Falls Lab, um, and, and doing projects of their definition. Um, that had some successes. It had some some failures, uh, we've moved now in, a, in the direction of more uh, developing uh, uh, a large-scale collaborative opportunities that could not be put together otherwise, um, and, then, and then having collaborators come in and join in these broader opportunities, and uh, Streamlab is, is our first uh, crack at that. Okay, so some of the motivation. The, um, uh, as I mentioned, Jeff and I are involved with the Stream Restoration Integrated Project, uh, and um, really our goal is to try and uh, uh, help try to catalyze the transformation of the stream restoration business from one that's more analogy to uh, one that's based more on prediction. Uh, a number of you are probably familiar with uh, uh, stream restoration practice, uh, stream restoration um, uh, confrontations and 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 so forth. Um, some projects have well-defined objectives. Many uh, projects don't. Uh, when they're well-defined, the objectives and whether the the objectives are well-defined or not, uh, oftentimes when you look closely at, at at a restoration design, the there is no essential logical connection between the objectives and the actual uh, uh, design activities. Uh, it, there's a lot of uh, uh, crossing of fingers and hoping and a little bit of faith-based uh, design that goes on. And um, given the amount of money that's being spent on stream restoration, given the, the state of many of our streams, particularly in urban areas, uh, a more predictive uh, uh, stream restoration science would certainly be uh, of, of great use. Um, if we go to the uh, nurse uh, uh, survey that was uh, recently conducted of stream restoration in, in the U.S., uh, many of the most commonly stated goals uh, are related to the ecosystem uh, uh, in one way or another, enhance water quality, uh, improve habitat, fish passage, and so forth. And uh, as 
almost anyone would know, but certainly our, our stream restoration partners have made very clear, you know, the connection between uh, what you might do in terms of a physical change to the stream channel and uh, the uh, ecological response is, is simply not well understood. It's certainly not predictive. Uh, and that's and that's something that we're uh, actively trying to address in NSAID uh, and in, in Streamlab. Um, so the idea is that uh, Streamlab is, is uh, uh, an effort that is that is sustained uh, as as an STC center. Uh, we we hopefully can identify worthy projects and stick with them long enough to to see them through. Uh, it's an experimental uh, approach. Uh, uh, taking uh, into account our, our focus on, on experimental as well as theoretical and field uh, research. Um, and it's very much focused on connections between the physical and, and, and the biological. Um, to the, uh, a couple of the facilities that we're going to be using, but uh, the idea is that, is that they're uh, large scale, uh, which takes care of some of the more difficult scaling issues that, that uh, uh, come up. And then, you know, if we're working together, well, we've got to be coordinated. We've got to uh, do our best to uh, uh, speak a common language and actually uh, work together. Um, so here's the essential motivation. And if there's if there's a concept in this talk, this is the slide, I guess, that expresses it most clearly. Um, this, uh, and this is very clear to those of us who who do experimental work. Uh, we tend to believe that there's very good information that can come out of experimental work, but when we scale things down, there's certainly plenty of things that don't scale well, and many of them are biotic. And so if we're trying to understand the ecological response to stream restoration changes, to be able to work at the field scale is certainly uh, uh, essential. And uh, at the same time, those who work in the field at field scale realize that they don't have the uh, uh, control that you can get with experiments, and so the, the, the marriage of these two ideas is to do field scale uh, experiments. So just some, some examples, um, uh, Mickey Hanzo uh, of NSTED and uh, St. Anthony Falls Lab is interested in the distribution and abundance of paraphyton in, uh, in stream beds. Uh, this is a, a process that's going to depend on the availability of nutrients, the local flow environment, the nature of the local substrate things that can change uh, in, in uh, time and in space. Uh, you can't really scale down the paraphyton, uh, and so you need to work at full scale. Uh, the paraphyton itself can, of course, affect the near-bed flow. It can affect the transport of, of the sediment, and, and so it's, it's not a one-way uh, street where the physical science is informing the biological. It's actually an interaction. Um, uh, even if we're looking only at the physical problems, uh, if, if we want to think about how bars, uh, alternate bars, point bars, uh, influence transport, if we want to think about how to do sediment routing over longer distances, we have to deal with those kinds of spatial uh, variabilities uh, in, in the transport, and, and only some of those successfully scale. If we want to look at, at gravel bars, we, we pretty much need to use gravel and work, work at that kind of scale. Um, those are a couple of topics that we're looking at this year in Streamlab. Uh, uh, in future years, riparian vegetation and bank stability is going to uh, come in, in, into play. And you know, plants, uh, trees are also uh, difficult to scale. And so we're looking at, at an outdoor facility where we can have experimental control on, on these kinds of broader uh, biotic and abiotic. Uh, Doing it at field scale, doing experiments at field scale is an essential motivation. And then the other one is uh, if we're to develop predictive models of, of uh, ecosystem change, of physical dynamics of real streams, um, well, we need to work together. Uh, you know, it's one thing uh, for individual disciplines to tell their own stories and not worry too much about plugging one into another, but if we're actually going to make predictions, uh, if we change the geometry of a channel in a certain way, if we change the substrate with so many dump trucks of gravel, uh, will we uh, change the nutrient uptake? Will we change the uh, amount and types of food for invertebrates and fish? If we want to predict that, uh, we, we clearly all have to work together, and Streamlab is a great opportunity to uh, practice that way. Um, so some introduction to the um, facilities. Uh, the picture here is of the main channel at St. Anthony Falls. Uh, 
uh, in, in good old fashioned, uh, units at six feet, uh, deep and nine feet wide, uh, and, uh, um, whatever 80 meters is, uh, long, it's, uh, can carry a river's worth of flow, eight and a half cubic meters per second. Um, at the downstream end, there is a, an adjustable sharp crested rear that, that sets the water surface elevation and, uh, Thanks to recent uh, renovations for Streamlab, it can now uh, recirculate uh, the sediment uh, around. Um, here's a cross section of the flume. Uh, the discharge comes in uh, from the Mississippi River uh, through a, uh, a newly restored uh, gate, uh, runs all the way down through the flume, and uh, uh, goes over the adjustable weir all the way over on the right uh, surface of the of the photograph. It goes around the bend and actually goes into large volumetric tanks that can be used to uh, measure the, uh, uh, the calibration. It's 55 meters long uh, between the uh, intake to the channel and, and the sediment return um, hopper. Uh, here's a view of maybe the upstream uh, 30, 35, 40 meters. Uh, the gravel that's in there and that you can see on the right uh, is the gravel that we're currently using in the Streamlab uh, 06 experiment. The one on the left is, just has water uh, uh, running through it. Uh, and, uh, well, actually, um, as a pointer out, this, this um, uh, cart at the upstream end is what we'll be referring to as the magic cart later on. Didn't realize I had a, had a picture of it. Okay, so an important part of these experiments is, um, you know, if you have a, a nine-foot bed of, of uh, gravel that's about three feet deep, um, you can't really feed sediment in at, at any persistent rate and, and live to tell about it. And so this uh, system is set up to recirculate sediment. And the recirculation was actually built into the flume uh, long ago, but the uh, um, uh, the system had had fallen out of use, and, and so quite a bit of uh, money was spent to uh, refurbish it. Um, and it can now re uh, recirculate sediment at up to um, 81 tons an hour, uh, and uh, not only takes sizes up to two and a half inch gravel, although the larger sizes may uh, break up some as they go through the, uh, go through the pump. Um, the way it works, this is, this is a, um, uh, a way and, and auger uh, system uh, that we use. Uh, the uh, sediment bed is here on the left. Sediment comes tumbling down into the slot, which runs across the full length of the flume. There are five drums uh, shown here in the blue. Each one is divided up into three uh, uh, sections. As sediment fills in, a load cell at the top is continuously weighing uh, the amount of sediment. When it's uh, uh, when the weight increases a certain reaches a certain amount, the drum rotates, dumps the sediment down into an auger down below, and then the next uh, portion starts to starts to fill. This is a picture of the um, uh, of, of, of the recirculation system. You can see uh, inside of these uh, metal sheaths are, are the load cell uh, connections, and then the drums are down here within the bed. So this is nine feet across, this is six feet deep. Um, it's, it's a rather large system. Okay, some of the other technologies. Um, we are, to, to track gravel transport, we are working on uh, placing RFID tags uh, in hundreds of gravel class places on the flume to, to keep track of them. Uh, we have what I'm calling the next-gen NSAID magic cart. Um, this uh, next-gen, because this cart shown here, was built by the St. Anthony Falls uh, lab for uh, use in, at the Richmond Field Station in, um, in Berkeley. Uh, and they, the, so this is a, a two foot wide or two and a half foot wide version, and now there's a nine foot wide version. Um, it basically drives itself at up to almost two meters a second, locates itself 
talking about Streamlab 06 in a little more detail, I want to mention, mention what comes next. So I'll just call that Streamlab++ plus plus in, in, in the future. And this is something that um, is it, it may be the most relevant part of this uh, talk because it hasn't happened yet. And so this is an opportunity that we're encouraging others to, uh, to be in touch with us about. So uh, let me give you a brief tour. Um, this is Hennepin Island on the St. Anthony Falls, which is right here. Uh, downtown uh, Minneapolis is right on this side. St. Anthony Falls Lab is, I'm just tracing it out there with the pointer. And next to the lab are two spillways that have not been used in quite a long time. The one closest to the lab is pictured here. This longer one is then, is then pictured there. So the idea for this outdoor laboratory for eco-hydraulics and river restoration is that these two facilities will be built into outdoor plumes, a, a shorter one here and a longer one there. Okay, so here's the shorter one uh, near the building uh, uh, called the Ecology and Land Use Dynamics Basin, uh, 30 meters long by 12 meters wide. It can take a flow of almost a cubic uh, meter per second. It can also impound water so we can look at both uh, uh, fluvial and, and uh, reservoir type uh, deposits. Okay, the other one shown here, 120 meters long, this can do the full 8.5 cubic meters per second or 300 uh, cubic feet per second. Um, the, the, the short one is going to be built this summer and then, and then the, the longer one will be uh, constructed. Okay, so now um, uh, this is just a sort of defining uh, the general purpose again, and it, it has two divisions. Uh, one of them is basically complete, and, and I'll briefly describe it. And then the, the second one, the ecogeomorphology, is just getting underway. So sediment transport monitoring technologies, um, although we worked with Sandbed, uh, I think the real motivation here, and I, I'm sure some of you realize this, our, our ability to measure gravel transport in the field is is remarkably weak, and, and it's, I think, one of the main reasons why uh, we have such a hard time, for example, coming up with credible sediment budgets in, uh, in steep watersheds. Uh, the ecogeomorphology part is, is um, about the, uh, the more standard stream lab kind of work where we're looking at the interaction between the physical and the biological. So let me just step through each one of these. Uh, the sediment transport monitoring. Um, this was in coordination with the suite of federal uh, agencies that tend to worry about and, and make official different kinds of bed load samplers. Uh, and uh, there is involved some testing of existing samplers, but also some testing of new technology. Uh, Colin Rennie from uh, University of Ottawa and uh, Dave Guyman from uh, USGS now with the Bureau of Reclamation were, were testing uh, the use of um, an acoustic Doppler current profiler to, uh, um, and its bottom tracking uh, 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 algorithm to see how that could be used to uh, measure uh, sediment transport rates in the, in, in the flume. This is, of course, has been tried in the field uh, in various cases, but this is a, uh, a setup where the transport rates are well measured and, uh, and they could try and calibrate it. Um, uh, bed load traps are just being tested now. Kristen Bunta, uh, supported by the stream team of the, of the Forest Service, has been uh, using these traps in, in a wide range of, of, of steep streams. Uh, this is an opportunity for her to calibrate them against well-measured uh, information. <clears throat> also tested were uh, some of the old favorites, uh, the Kelly Smith, the BL84, which, uh, which is the um, uh, which is the official uh, federally sanctioned uh, sampler, but then a couple other samplers, including this one, the Toodle River uh, number two sampler, uh, six inches high, 12 inches across, uh, with a different kind of fin setup uh, here on a cataract arrangement with Graham Matthews driving, um, and uh, it tends to have uh, much more stable behavior down near the bed, and so these were, uh, in, in a classic uh, kind of way, tested against each other over the uh, first few months of here. Okay, the eco-geomorphology research. Um, so here we're uh, uh, going to look at the interaction between gravel, transport, uh, bars, storage, uh, how surface siding, sorting occurs, and armoring, uh, and, and how
how that interacts with hyperic exchange, nutrient uptake, uh, parafine growth, growth and, and, and so forth. Um, so this is uh, my schematic that sort of describes the suite of runs. I'll go through that uh, in a minute. But um, again, the talk is really about the, the Streamlab concept and, and opportunity. Uh, and, and so this is a nice example of it. I mean, the, the folks at St. Anthony Falls Lab and NSAID have worked hard to get the main channel running in a way that will recirculate sediment uh, and, and, and have this magic cart for use. And so there's essentially a test bed for research where uh, a, a group of people, in this case uh, a couple dozen, can work together on, on from uh, near bed flow to transport to hyper uh, exchange to uh, the benthos uh, and so forth. So the facility is there. There is some ability to support provide support for people to come in and work, although we certainly can't support the, the, the whole uh, uh, set of folks coming in and working, but uh, the opportunity is, is, I think, a very good one. Okay, so here's uh, what the experiments look like. Uh, CG means uh, clean gravel, SG means sandy gravel, so you saw a picture of the gravel earlier, about 1 to 35, 36 millimeters. Uh, in, in range of size, so you know within a realistic size, and this is a uh, you know a basically field scale setup. Um, we will do runs with plain bed transport, two of them, and then we will lower the flow depth and have alternate bars uh, develop on their own. We'll do a couple of those, um, and we'll do two of each, so we'll have a moderate transport rate and a high transport rate. Um, we'll then have an experiment where we armor the bed, run clear water for a week, let all the movable sediment out introduce finer gravel in, in a test of gravel augmentation concepts, uh, something that is being increasingly used below dams for uh, 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 rejuvenating and, and activating uh, gravel beds. Um, then we'll rearmor. We'll have a sand infiltration experiment, uh, again, at field scale with, with you know, topography and all the surface sorting. Add more sand, and then we'll sort of repeat the first two sets uh, uh, plain bed uh, bar runs with a sandy gravel. Uh, so now we can con contrast plain to alternate bars and then clean gravel to sandy gravel. And then before it gets cold in, in Minneapolis, um, we will grow a bunch of parafighting on the bed over a few weeks and, and, and then see how that interacts with the uh, flow and the transport. Um, the cast of folks involved. Uh, a number of, of colleagues from uh, Berkeley and from Stillwater Science, uh, and, and uh, they have a large CalFed um, uh, grant to support uh, experimental studies in support of, of uh, stream restoration. Uh, people from St. Anthony Falls, uh, me, uh, Oregon State University, Gordon Grant, Ann Jefferson, and Jeff Clark from uh, Lawrence University. Um, so here's the topics that we're looking at, and, and, they're, and as they should be, they're all related. And, and the simplest way to describe what's going on is, is to uh, just pose the simple question, what's the effect of topography and sand content in a gravel bed river on, and then you just put your, your topic here. So um, uh, a number of us are interested just in the gravel transport rates uh, and how sediment is stored in the alternate bars. Um, practical gravel routing through watersheds uh, needs to be done with one-dimensional models. Uh, the information requirements, uh, the boundary conditions needed for higher dimensional models are simply uh, not going to be available in, with sufficient accuracy. But if we do one-dimensional modeling, how do we handle sediment going into and out of storage? Uh, we've done some work uh, within NSAID on, on sand storage in the Grand Canyon. Uh, that's an easy case in a sense because the storage locations are well understood and easy to locate. Uh, gravel bars are a little harder to do, but so we're, we're interested in, in, in understanding and developing a, a way of modeling changes in storage uh, in, using a one-dimensional model. Um, one of the uh, uh, spatial uh, variations that's going to happen is, is uh, surface sorting and, and, and patchiness, uh, and, num and at the end of each run, we will be taking high-resolution uh, uh, millimeter scale uh, Vertical resolution DEM of the bed to track uh, what the what the surface uh, looks like and what its variability is and so forth. Um, there'll be hyperic exchange uh, 
uh, runs done with uh, conservative uh, tracers uh, each, in each one of the runs, and, uh, and some of the interactions that start to emerge, uh, you know, relatively obvious questions, but uh, ones that we haven't really addressed with field-scale experiments. Uh, you know, how do, how do the rates of transport, how do the spatial variability of the sediment uh, affect the rates of hyperic exchange? How, do the, how does the gravel transport or its components, the, the displacements of, of grains, uh, change with, with uh, surface texture and, and patches? Okay, continuing the list of questions, um, one interesting topic is temperature modification. Uh, Portland Gas and Electric, uh, through Gordon Grant and Ann Jefferson, is interested in how exchange of fluid with the stream bed uh, can act as a temperature buffer uh, on, on, a, on a, a dial basis. Uh, and so we're trying to uh, look at that also within the control conditions of Streamlab. And then uh, nutrient uptake, there will be um, um, measurements of, of nutrient uptake over the length of the flume and over the length of individual bed forms uh, connected, uh, this work uh, uh, to, uh, data collected in, in connection with the hyperic exchange. Um, uh, Paraphyte and abundance distribution dynamics, really that should include both uh, 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 autotrophs and heterotrophs, and, and uh, because this is Mississippi water, uh, benthic invertebrates as well, hopefully no fish, but they get in from time to time. Uh, and, and the questions here are, you know, uh, how does the distribution change with the composition of the substrate? How does it change with the amount of fines? How does, it, uh, how does the di distribution of periphyton change with the locations of more or less uh, nutrients, and, and so on? The, the interactions become quite clear and quite complex uh, by all of us playing together in the same sandbox, uh, we hope to be able to, to make some progress. Um, if, if I, I guess I can go back, can't I? It's quite sophisticated. Um, the, each one of the runs that are shown here, uh, they run sort of on a weekly time scale. There's a couple days of transport runs, and then there's a couple days of very low flow runs that allow the uptake measurements to be made, the metabolism measurements to be made, and then a couple days of a drain bed uh, so that we can poke around very carefully, and then we sort of step through all of the uh, experiments. Okay, uh, between the clean and the sandy bed runs uh, is when we'll do the gravel augmentation and sand infiltration parts of the uh, experiment. Uh, the picture shown here is uh, the Bloom at the Richmond Field Station. This is a three millimeter pea gravel uh, gravel augmentation that's been added to the gravel that, uh, that's in the flume. Um, gravel augmentation is increasingly used to to uh, uh, try and address uh, stream restoration below dams, uh, essentially as part of an effort to uh, return flows or return sediment supply below dams without taking the dam out. And, 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 and the question is, you know, how much of the ecosystem can we recover uh, uh, with, with, with these kinds of uh, actions? So uh, in advance of adding the peak gravel, we'll have uh, a, a, an armoring uh, run, clear water run. Uh, we'll also look carefully at the bed structures that are formed, re-armor, and then look at the sand infiltration that, that can develop um, um, uh, as well. Now, one of the topics that's of interest to me is uh, when we add fine sediment to a, to a gravel bed, um, we've observed in different cases, in different flumes, that the transport rates uh, increase uh, dramatically uh, by orders of magnitude under some circumstances. And uh, what's exciting to me is that to do this at, at essentially the field scale uh, with the topography, um, it will be interesting to see whether that very large impact is, is as, as large with the uh, with the topography as, as, it, as it is um, in, a, in a plain bed plume. Because certainly it's an important uh, effect that we've observed. Okay, just some of the detail of uh, things that, that, uh, that we're uh, measuring. Um, uh, with the RFIDs, we're, we're going to be looking at the displacement lengths, the pathways of, of the tagged rocks um, to try and understand better the effect of, of Surface sorting and um, and bars on the transport um, patches will be mapped. Uh, they'll be they'll be identifiable from the millimeter scale uh, DEM that will be taken from the uh, from the magic.
its heart. Um, uh, there's sufficient um, uh, ADV instruments around to, to make uh, 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 measurements of near bed flow, near bed turbulence over the different kinds of structures. Uh, the nitrogen and phosphorus uptake will be measured both at the reach scale, but also uh, with enough meters by sampling along uh, subsurface paths and uh, looking at how the uptake changes with topography, uh, both uh, with an increase in uh, subsurface exchange and surface flow uh, storage. Um, we can turn out the lights. We can measure the respiration. Um, uh, we, we will be able to measure the uh, biomass uh, within the plume. Uh, we'll be picking out the bugs. Uh, and accounting for the carbon flux uh, through the reach, and so it's it's a uh, you know it's a field scale, but a, a controlled experiment where we're hoping to pull all the pieces together uh, into uh, a complete data set that's archivable that will be available to others uh, to use. Uh, so a uh, couple more slides. Um, but what Streamlab 06 is about is, is the gravel transport and the ecodynamics uh, in, in, in a laboratory setting with high resolution uh, data uh, where we don't have to worry about uh, uh, scaling effects, but where we do have to worry about all working well together and trying to develop predictive models uh, connecting the physical and the chemical and the uh, biological. Um, and uh, this is our first take on what we hope is um, uh, an ongoing set of field scale collaborative experiments that is theory and, and also something that NSAID uh, is able to support. So this is just repeating um, uh, a slide from earlier, uh, reminding you not only of, of the Streamlab opportunity, but all the other opportunities to participate uh, within NSAID. And so um, I guess if I had been with it, I would have added Streamlab in capital letters down here just to make it uh, clear. But um, uh, the outdoor facility, I think, is going to be really exciting. Uh, there's certainly the possibility of doing more within the main channel uh, at St. Anthony Falls. And uh, this is a picture of the Angelo Coast Range Reserve on the south fork of the Eel River in Northern California. Uh, Mary Power, an NSAID uh, uh, principal investigator, is the uh, faculty um, whatever it's called, manager of, of, of that reserve. And this is, this is a, a, a center of, of NSAID uh, uh, collaborative research. Um, we can open it up for questions now. Well, Peter, thank you very much for an interesting talk. And so uh, for those of you who have questions out there, you can type those in the chat box or hit star zero, I believe. Right, operator? That would be star one to ask a question. Star one. So star one to get in the audio queue or type of chat. So I have one to start. Um, this is really interesting stuff. Thanks for doing this. Um, I guess in particular, uh, uh, the hyperreak exchange bit mm -hmm. was was pretty interesting. Do you know um, at this point what the spatial resolution of those measurements will be for exchange areas? I mean, how, how, um, what's the spatial distribution of measurements that you're going to be making to estimate where these hot zones are? Um, well, the, the spatial distribution of the uptake uh, measurements, uh, I believe um, uh, Jeff might know a little better. I, I think we, we have the capability of observing um, changes in nutrient con uh, concentration over uh, I think four segments, and so it, uh, it, it depends on where the, the, the meters are placed, but, I, but the idea is that um, we could either sample, uh, well, I think, I think the idea is to sample the uptake at the scale of the alternate bars that develop. Hmm. Okay. And they're also, the, the, the group is also looking at a reach, the, the full reach, just doing kind of standard uh, uh, a tracer injection, conservative and non-conservative tracers. Uh, so looking at a bulk um, uptake levels and also hyperreic exchange and dilutions, um, but also they're arming, like Peter mentioned, uh, several bar series in a row as detailed as they can with conductivity sensors um, and temperature probes, see if we can uh, follow uh, uh, 
fluids through the through the bed. So. Uh, should I address this uh, yes, yes, question. question from Henry? No, perhaps we lost John. He may be chatting with that. Right? Oh, okay, well, so there's a question here from Henry Lynn. Uh, what specific subsurface flow path uh, may you be referring to for uh, nitrogen and phosphorus uptake? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, well, I'm not sure the answer to that question. Um, we're we're looking at uh, flow paths that will occur both with a plain bed and with with bed forms, and and how they will change with the uh, with the um, uh, topography. Um, there will be some sensing done within the bed. Um, uh, so, oh, okay, this is. For someone who doesn't handle multiple things at once, this is getting tricky. Um, so, any, anyway, uh, Henry, if you can uh, be more specific with your question, I, I, I think that uh, different depths will be monitored uh, with, with sensors. There'll be there'll be a whole array of conductivity sensors down within the bed. So we we can hopefully pick up the different uh, lengths. Mm -hmm. So from uh, Breck Bowden. How will metabolism be measured? Uh, what is the residence time? Will the flume be operated in a flow-through or recirculating mode? Uh, okay, the, the, the sediment is recirculated. The water uh, is flow-through. Um, we, we don't have a, 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 an ability to, to pump that much water around, or, or we're not set up to do that. Um, the residence time of the water, um, uh, well, I'd have to back calculate it, but we were talking about something of the order of five centimeters a second, I think, mean velocity uh, uh, during the uptake measurement. So, you know, a couple of days of high flow rates in transport, a couple of days of, of, of low uh, uh, velocity for the uptake. And how will the metabolism be measured? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'm still learning this stuff. We should have gotten one of our ecologists up here. Yeah, yeah. But I see that. I'm the only one that lost phone connection, apparently, so that's good. Okay. Yeah, I've just, we've just addressed a couple chat questions. And so about that question that Breck asked about the residence time of water, what was the answer on that? Um, I, I don't remember exactly what, what I do. Well, it's I think we're talking about uh, a four or five centimeters per second mean velocity over the 55-meter uh, length of the flume. Okay. And is a, I, mean, I know you mentioned the sediment. Um, and actually, is this for the outdoor stuff that you're referring to, or the the flume? Uh, well, I'm referring to the uh, the experiments this year in in the main channel. Okay. Um, so uh, there will be uh, one, uh, you know, an advantage and a disadvantage of the system. I mean, we're using real water, and so the real water is variable. Sure. Uh, out of the Mississippi over time and and across the seasons, it's going to warm up considerably in the next uh, month or so. Uh, and so there is a, um, I can't remember what it's called, um, uh, a something or other, a stream, stream uh, what is it, Jeff, that, that they have upstream and downstream. Oh, the, the hydro labs. A hydro lab, yeah. well, one lives upstream in the inflowing water, one lives downstream in the out, outgoing water. Uh, so, so we do have a continuous measurement of of various uh, water parameters. Yes. Okay. And so the water itself is not recirculated. No. Okay. No. Any other questions out there? Brett, did you want to clarify anything or ask another question? Or Henry, for that matter? So, when does this stuff start? Frame or? Uh, uh, no, well, the the I mean the first set of experiments is complete. Uh, the, the the meter testing, the um, first set of experiments uh, for the second phase is hopefully.
hopefully next week. We you know we had some issues, uh, 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 equipment issues with the head gates and so forth, but um, we're hoping to be uh, doing this in anger by uh, the end of next week. Uh, and, and we're and that's partly because we're on a timeline. Um, uh, we uh, during the warm water season we want to do the parafighting part. So August, September, uh, you know we're going to shut things down to a trickle and and, and grow a crop of uh, slime in the flume. Yeah. Um, and and so we need to get as much done as we can before then. And and uh, we may have to then in mid September have Noah's flood and clean that out and 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 move back to some of the other uh, experiments. But uh, the time frame is basically the next six months. Mm -hmm. Great. And then we'll be uh, hopefully having the first outdoor plume, um, you know, uh, available by by um, uh, next summer. Okay. So uh, Breck is asking if he can ask questions directly. Yeah. So is the operator there? Yes, I am. And it's star one, correct? Correct. I have Breck Bowden in the queue at this time. Okay. Please proceed, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I can. How you doing, Brett? Uh, hey, how you doing, John? Uh, hey, Peter. This is uh, really looks exciting. I was asking the the question about the residence time because I'm wondering what sort of resolution on a a once through uh, passage in the flume you have to have to be able to uh, see metabolism and and uptake it. It it seems to me that the that the residence time might be on the order of of uh, ten minutes or so, or a, a few tens of minutes. Is that right? I, I I think ten minutes sounds right, uh, in part because it was like five centimeters a second and fifty five meters. And uh we we had we had a, a meeting of all the participants uh, a week ago and and I was saying, gee, don't you need about thirty minutes? And and those who seem to know what they're doing said that ten would be sufficient. Yeah, that that's probably I mean if you're using a whole stream metabolism approach which which sounds like you're doing with the hydro labs that's going to probably be pressing it for the for the resolution that you need. It, you know, 20 minutes would be better. 30 minutes would be would be great. 10 minutes might be pressing it a little bit. I was wondering about the opportunity for for using um, isotopes for some of the the uh, nutrient work, nutrient uptake work, where you might be able to increase the sensitivity. I don't. I mean, Mickey Hanzo does does some of that work. I I don't know. What their plans are to uh, to incorporate that? Uh, certainly, we can. Um, we if if the uptake or the metabolism is is not being measured adequately, we can always turn the flow down, um, and, you know, to the smallest possible trickle. Now, uh, you know, a, a, a channel this size, you can't really run it at a liter per second with any accuracy. But um, um, the uh, we, it seems to me we can we can sort of manage the experiment uh, adaptively. Your your point about isotopes is well taken. I I I thought there was a conversation on that in that regard, but I I will certainly contact uh, Mickey and uh, Kaylin Moore as a postdoc who is who is uh, working on this as well. So is it Mickey Hanzo that is that is responsible for the metabolism and and the nutrient work? Well, it's Mickey Hanzo, uh, Jacques Finley, um and Kaylin Orr is, is, is the postdoc who's, who's, you know, get, you know, actually getting a lot of the work done, and, and a couple others. Okay, thanks. Sure. As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, please press star one. There are no questions in the queue. Okay. Well, um, well, people are thinking about it or hesitating as the case may be. I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank you both again. Uh, this was a really interesting presentation, and I think it's great to get the word out that this is going on and how folks can get involved. Yeah, um, you know where to find us, and uh, this is this, if, if we don't have collaborators from outside, it won't, it won't be a success. Yeah. Okay. Last chance for any questions? Okay. Well, thanks a lot, everyone, for dialing in. Um, we'll be back on Thursday, May 11th, with Paul Brooks from SARA talking about a prototype observatory. 
And actually, just to quickly note, uh, a quasi newsletter went out yesterday, I believe that was, for a briefing by Doug Payne on a synthesis center uh, project that is on an NSF solicitation right now. That's going to be next Thursday, May 4th. So thanks again, uh, Peter and Jeff. Sure thing. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having us.